do is for the next 40 minutes or so just give you an idea of um, from an from an economist perspective on an issue of great environmental importance an issue of great economic importance uh, and a issue of great scientific controversy um, and that has to do not only with climate change but the role of forests in uh, mitigating climate change, and by that I mean changing the way that we manage forests to reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and to thereby reduce threats from future climate change. As Marty mentioned in his comments, this is an, something that I've worked on. He didn't mention the um, time period of that report, but it was published in 2000, so it's something that I've been working on for the better part of 15 years, including uh, in that far-reaching effort, several people from the University of Alberta. Uh, so it's an issue that seems like it's very current and very hot right now, no pun intended, but it is something that has really, uh, the scientific uh, knowledge has been accumulating some over time, although, as we'll see, there's still a great deal of uncertainty left. So I'm going to start by trying to frame this in the context of ecosystem services. Now, ecosystem services is a concept that really the, the term has been new in the last 10 years, and it was a term that uh, I would say as an economist that ecologists hijacked from economists, but there was a terrific book that was put out by an ecologist, Gretchen Daly, from Stanford University uh, called Nature Services, and um, it was, uh, she did a wonderful job of explaining it as a scientist, explaining the concept of nature <clears throat> as a form of capital that economists had been talking about for centuries and did it in a way that was perhaps far more understandable to sympathetic audiences than the economists have. But there have been for, uh, economists have been working on this notion of natural capital for since the 1960s and 70s. Uh, uh, an economist, John Crutilla, with Resources for the Future, um, did some path-breaking work in the 1960s and wrote a uh, seminal book with Anthony Fisher in 1975, um, where the, the cover is shown here, The Economics of Natural Environments. And so the point here is <clears throat> thinking of nature um, not, just in, not just in its splendor, which we can all uh, appreciate and respect and, and, um, and honor, uh, but thinking of it through the cool eyes of an economist, which is what does it do in terms of generating flows of goods and services that humans value? So you can think of ecosystem services as having use values and non-use values. Um, th that, that means that there are things that humans directly use that come from the environment, uh, and then there are things that humans sort of indirectly use. They might enjoy scenic beauty or just the aura of nature. And I'm going to focus on the more sort of hard and fact use values uh, that the natural environment brings to us. So. First of all, natural ecosystems provide traditional commodities that we've been uh, enjoying as long as we've been running around on Earth's surface, food, fuel, and fiber. Uh, but there are another, a, a number of non-traditional services that ecosystems provide um, that at first glance we might not think of something that is a direct uh, product of nature. We might not think of it, or if we think of it as a direct product of nature, we don't necessarily think of it as an economic service, but it is. Um, you know, one example would be water quality provision. So the roles that trees and vegetation play in filtering runoff from the land into the water. Uh, the, the, the role that trees play in the broader climate system in terms of evapotranspiration. Waste assimilation. Uh, wetlands in particular can um, absorb waste, whether it be human waste or agricultural waste, reprocess them so that they're in an inert form and don't cause damage to humans. Storm protection. Um, we saw in the south central of the United States the importance of intact wetlands uh, and the difficulties associated with rerouting large river systems to meet human needs when we have a once-in-a-lifetime hurricane event like Hurricane Katrina. Uh, that uh, caused tremendous damage uh, to New Orleans and the surrounding areas that many believe um, 
Certainly the damage would have been extreme, but it would have been less so had intact wetlands been in place. Um, biodiversity, uh, producer of genetic resources, these types of things are all services that humans value that are produced by nature. And the one that I'm going to focus on today is the service of climate regulation. So I'm going to make a three-part proposition to you um, as an economist, which you can take or leave. Um, the first is that markets work extremely well at deciding what it is that we humans choose to produce. And, um, and so the markets that have been in place have tended to uh, favor tra the traditional commodities of food, fiber, and fuel. So crops, timber, livestock. And that's all good, all meeting human needs. Strong market signals. Anybody who operates in those businesses can tell you on a daily basis what the price is of the commodity that they produce. And they can tell you that they make adjustments to their production practices in response to changes in those prices. All good signals guiding what it is that we get from the land. Um, I will also make an assertion that some non-traditional ecosystem services um, are just as valuable or perhaps even more from an economic perspective than some, tr than some traditional commodities. And I'm, and I'm careful in my wording. Some ecosystem services are more valuable than some traditional commodities. I'm not trying to say that we should um, stop producing traditional commodities in favor of ecosystem services, but we need to view it from the context of trade-off, maybe on an individual service-by-service -service basis. But these non-traditional ecosystem services tend not to have markets, and so they tend to be underproduced. Um, this is what economists refer to as market failure. Um, and we can correct this problem by putting prices on those non-traditional goods and services, either through payment schemes <clears throat> or through the use of markets. And since we have at least acknowledged this problem that sometimes traditional commodity production can cause degradation of other ecosystem services, even when we haven't called it that, we have addressed this problem by traditional regulations. And one way of viewing this is that if we develop markets for these non-traditional ecosystem services, we can think of this as an alternative to sort of clunky regulatory approaches that might, um, that might be more onerous than they need to be in order to accomplish the same environmental goals. So there are, though, although they are not that common, there are examples of ecosystem service markets for these non-traditional goods out there um, or payment systems. So for one is that New York City has been paying farmers uh, upstream of the city uh, for two or three decades now to forego um, more intense practices and to forego development of their land and they receive payments for that, and the, the payments they receive are premised off of the notion that it provides cleaner water for New York City. And New York City came to this decision about 25 or 30 years ago when it realized it was going to cost $9 billion to create a new water treatment facility to serve New York. So this was seen as a much less expensive alternative, and New Yorkers like to brag about a lot of things, but one of the things they do like to brag about is that they have the cleanest water uh, in the United States, at least of any city. Um, also, farmers have been trading um, in terms of water quality markets. Uh, there have been uh, nutrient trading markets that have been established between farmers and water treatment facilities uh, in different parts of the United States um, that um, help the water treatment facilities meet their regulatory obligations by paying farmers to change their practices and keep nitrogen and phosphorus out of the waterway. Um, there's been wetlands mitigation banking um, operating, uh, in the, again, in the United States. Um, I'm familiar with, uh, with uh, Canadian practice on that regard, but um, where um, you can destroy a wetland, a developer can destroy a wetland in one place, but only if they protect or restore a wetland in another place. And so that's sort of a form of, of trading here. Um, and conservation banking's like that, is any destruction of, uh, of habitat, particularly destruction of habitat with threatened species, needs to be met by matching increase in habitat for that species by the developer. And that's a form of ecosystem service trading that's in place. Uh, and there are climate mitigation payment schemes uh, including uh, here in the province of Alberta um, with um, payments for sequestered carbon. Now, that has been primarily focused on agriculture 
in Alberta so far, I understand that there are uh, afforestation protocols that are in stages of development uh, right now, uh, but for now, it's primarily agriculture and other sectors. So I'm going to focus then on uh, the, the remainder of my com uh, comments on uh, forest uh, or climate mitigation as a forest ecosystem service. So this starts with the observation that there's a long-term historical record uh, between concentrations of carbon dioxide temperature and um, carbon emissions from sources, from anthropogenic sources. Um, and so the carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere can be directly traced to these anthropogenic activities. The uh, carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere has coincided with a rise in temperature. The, uh, the scientific theory associated with that is fairly solid. Uh, and so this, this basically this simple observation that has many complex processes underlying it is essentially the foundation for climate policy, the notion that if this were to continue unabated uh, for uh, the foreseeable future, that we could take ourselves <clears throat> to concentrations well outside the comfort zone. So what do forests have to do with that? Here is a grossly oversimplified view of the, of the global carbon cycle uh, uh, that shows the exchange of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, be, you know, first of all, starting uh, with the emissions of greenhouse gases from industrial activity uh, from the smokestacks over there um, into the atmosphere. But that is dwarfed uh, by the exchange of carbon dioxide between terrestrial ecosystems and the ocean and the atmosphere. However, even though that has been dwarfed by the exchange of CO2 uh, between terrestrial ecosystems in the atmosphere and oceans in the atmosphere, uh, the fact remains that those systems would be in steady state, keeping a relatively constant amount of carbon dioxide remaining in the atmosphere. And it's the pulse that's added every year by the burning of fossil fuels that is leading over time to increase CO2 concentrations. So forests can play a role in that they can do one of two things. The more forests you have, the more you remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And the more forests you cut down, the more that CO2 gets emitted back into the atmosphere. So here's a, um, a recent uh, paper uh, in the journal Nature Geosciences, looks at um, the global carbon balance. And this is, this is um, a study that tends to get reproduced every couple of years, we're quite interested in what the flux and flow and stocks are between the atmospheric CO2 and our terrestrial and ocean ecosystems. So in this diagram, what we see <coughs> is the, um, the largest column to the left are fossil fuel emissions. Uh, and they are being emitted uh, to the tune of about 8 billion tons uh, per year of carbon equivalent, which is about 30 to 31 billion tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Um, the source that's next to that is through land use change, which is primarily deforestation. Uh, and that um, ranges anywhere from about 4 to 8 gigaton CO2 equivalent per year. What I'm showing you here is actually for one year, 2008, on the left side, and I'm going to also point to the right where we see there's a lot of natural variability from year to year in the rates that CO2 is removed from the atmosphere and the rates at which it's reintroduced to the atmosphere as well. So we see then those are the two main sources, uh, but we have the sinks from terrestrial systems right here, the, the sinks from the ocean system right there, and then since these all come from different observational systems, and we can observe the increase in atmospheric CO2. There's kind of this wash category called residual that, that comes and goes that scientists sort of scratch their head at. But by and large, what we see is a system that's in balance. So what goes up into the atmosphere either remains in the, either is drawn back into terrestrial and ocean systems back from the atmosphere, or it remains in the atmosphere to elevate CO2 concentrations. Uh, much of these land use change emissions are deforestation in the tropics, and much of the sink occurs in the temperate zone. 
So one temperate zone country to take a look at is Canada. And this is a study uh, that was published uh, fairly recently from the Canadian Forest Service that looks at Canada as a source or a sink, uh, Canadian forests as a source or sink of CO2. And as you can see, the, that's zero right there. So if it's above zero, it's a, it's a source. <clears throat> if it's below zero, it's a sink. So since 1990, um, most of the time, the Canadian forests have been a sink, meaning they're absorbing more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than they're re-emitting. Uh, but there have been several years where it's been a source. And of particular um, uh, notice is the last five years in this uh, data, uh, where we see that um, the introduction of CO2 emissions through forest loss from insects and fire have been re had ramped up rather considerably. And I know there's a number of people in this room who do research in that area and perhaps don't find that um, too surprising. But you'll see that, the, that the, the beige box at the bottom here is through harvesting activity and that that's relatively constant in Canada over time. So the way in which Canadians manage their forests for timber really has a relatively small effect on whether Canadian forests are a source or a sink. And then part, part of that is because it's managed fairly steadily in terms of the output from the timber sector. However, the real thing that pushes it above and below the line are these natural disturbances from insects, fire, disease. And that's actually really quite remarkable, say, if you compare that to the United States, where uh, in the United States has been running a sink in roughly in the range of 800 million tons CO2 equivalent per year to uh, 1 billion tons CO2 equivalent per year. And it's because essentially the relative ratio of managed forest activity to the total forest space is higher there than it is in Canada. So the, it's not the natural fluctuations that push things above and below the line in the US like they do in Canada. So this has policy implications. <clears throat> the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the big international treaty that all countries of the world are signed up to in one way, shape, or form, uh, it's where the Kyoto Protocol resides, if you follow climate policy, um, re requires each country to report its greenhouse gas emissions. And it gives each country the option of whether or not to count its managed forests as part of its emissions account. And after doing an analysis such as the one that I just showed you, the government of Canada, given that option, has opted not to include um, managed forests as part of its greenhouse gas account. Not because they don't think that there are things that Canada can do to improve the conditions there, but because of the significant role that insects and other forms of disturbance play on forest emissions from Canada, there's a great risk that if, if the country just takes it on and says, we'll manage that account, and you have these large pulses, that that's going to make meeting the rest of the targets that Canada has set for itself under the Kyoto Protocol, challenging targets as they are, that much more difficult. So Canada has taken, uh, taken a look at the science and made a decision in its own best interest not to count those emissions right now, or to count them, but not count them against their obligations. <clears throat> okay. So now that we have a sense of the relationship between forests and the atmosphere, what do we mean by forest carbon mitigation? Well, we mean you can do one of two things. You can increase forest carbon sinks through activities like afforestation and reforestation or forest management. So you can change your forest to extend out rotations and keep the carbon density up, or try to intervene on behalf of reducing the, uh, the natural disturbances from insects and fire, which, as many people in the room can tell you, is a challenging endeavor. Um, you can also look to reduce the sources of greenhouse gases from the forest sector by reducing deforestation and degradation, a term called RED, reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation, which we'll see is, is had primarily, uh, primary relevance in the tropics and which will be the focus of the last half of my comments today. <clears throat> and then red plus is kind of a combination of the above, and I'll, by that, I mean, it's reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation 
as well as carbon stock enhancement, which could include afforestation, reforestation, and forest management. So it's sort of an all-encompassing term. So these are ways to change the way the forest is managed to mitigate climate threats. <clears throat> well, there's an economic case for this, and this comes from the last IPCC assessment report um, that looks at um, a number of different sectors in the global economy and how expensive it is to reduce greenhouse gases from those sectors. As we can see here, the forest sector, which is the second one from the right, uh, we can look at these as, a, for the economists in the room, they're kind of like step supply functions. So at different prices, which in this case is less than $20 a ton uh, US CO2 equivalent, I guess I don't have to make the US distinction since the US and Canadian dollars are on par right now, so I'll just call them dollars. Uh, 20, 50, and $100 a ton means you get more and more mitigation. So you can see from the forest sector is one of the lower cost mitigation options globally, um, which, is, which is helpful. You know, what you want to do is you want to use as many opportunities as you can to reduce greenhouse gases as cost effectively as possible across as many different sectors of the economy. So it makes sense that including forest sector emissions will help the world achieve its greenhouse gas reductions in a more cost-effective manner. This is a result of some work that I did um, in the U.S. With a, uh, with a team of economists where we looked at what the greenhouse gas mitigation potential is from agriculture and forestry just in the U.S. Uh, and I, I just want to draw your attention to the two forest activities, afforestation and forest management, and we looked at a range of CO2 equivalent prices. And for point of reference right now, there are CO2 markets that are operating in Europe, and they're trading in the range of about $20 or $30 a ton CO2 equivalent. So we can see at the lower price range, we actually see that forest management activity in the U.S. can provide <clears throat> up to a couple hundred million tons CO2 equivalent mitigation option, uh, opportunity. And then at the higher prices, from $30 and above, we see that that's high enough to move land out of agriculture into forest. And when you move land out of agriculture into forest, you absorb a lot more carbon dioxide through forest ecosystems. And if you pay landowners for that, that's a more profitable way to use their land. And you can see that at those high prices, you can have uh, upwards of 800 million tons CO2 equivalent impact. And you put that in, that's about one eighth of US CO2 emissions right now. So it's a non-trivial part of the mitigation portfolio. Well, I've said about all I'm going to say um, about temporal, temperate and boreal ecosystems right now, and I'm going to focus the rest of my comments now on tropical systems, because that's where the international policy has been focused. So first, I'll point out, and I guess you can see that reasonably well from back there, uh, but we have deforestation occurring uh, throughout all the major tropical regions of the world. You can see that um, in the, in the and this is from the most recent data that are collected uh, by the FAO, um, but the, uh, um, the, the rates of deforestation in the tropical regions uh, range anywhere from about a half a percent to 2 percent per year uh, over the period 2000 to 2005. Um, in terms of total area, uh, the largest losses are in Africa, but in terms of percentage in Central America, but that's just a lot less area. Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, I should say it teeters back and forth between Africa and South America, and in South America it's primarily in the Amazon region. If we were to rank the top 10 um, countries in terms of their deforestation emissions, we see, perhaps unsurprisingly, that Brazil and Indonesia are at the top of the list, followed by several African countries, and um, coming in at the end um, with Venezuela. So this is a fair amount of deforestation that's occurring. Uh, on an annual basis, uh, throughout most of the last decade, we've been losing about 13 million hectares per year. Uh, I say that's roughly the size of the state that I live in, North Carolina, being lost every year in terms of tropical forests. As I'll show you in a bit, those rates have declined some over, over the last few years because of the disruption of the, uh, of the global economy. Uh, but those rates have been uh, sustained for a good, good part of the last decade. Land use emissions and deforestation actually change your view of who the top greenhouse gas emitters are in the world. Uh, it's not surprising to find China and the U.S. at the front of the list, but it may be surprising to some of you 
to see that when we count emissions from deforestation, that Brazil is the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world, and that Indonesia is the seventh largest greenhouse gas emitter. And both of those countries get about two-thirds of their emissions from deforestation. <clears throat> there are a number of drivers of tropical deforestation. Um, and I just I sort of cluster them by tropical region of the world. Uh, it's not a perfect descriptor because all of these things drive deforestation in all these places. But in the Amazon, it's being driven particularly by agriculture, both crop agriculture, for instance, soybean production, uh, but livestock agriculture as well for cattle production. The cattle production has tapered off some in the region, or at least the deforestation attributable to cattle production is. But there's been a, um, <clears throat> Brazil is now the, I believe the largest, uh, second largest exporter of soybeans in the world right now, and they've done all that pretty much in the last decade. Um, in the Congo Basin of Africa, it tends to be smaller scale logging and uh, sub uh, not just subsistence agriculture, but smaller scale agriculture. Um, and in Southeast Asia, uh, logging has traditionally been a problem, but in the last decade or two, oil palm production uh, to feed, in large part, um, global biofuel demands that have been ironically driven uh, by the need to meet climate change obligations in certain parts of the world has been a major driver of deforestation in uh, Indonesia, and, <coughs> excuse me, and Malaysia in particular. So with this, and these are um, all, if you're a landowner, uh, these are all attractive opportunities for you. Not in all places, but in many places it is. And so to give a particular example, we think about oil palm production in Southeast Asia. And so what I've looked at is that I've looked at sort of a range of opportunity, what we would call opportunity costs for stopping deforestation in these places. How much would you have to pay a landowner to give up the profit that they can make for growing oil palm in Malaysia or Indonesia? And so you look at a range, and let's say, so if we look at the light blue color there, it's a range of different values that you can get for oil palm production. And if we look at the dark view figure there, we could see um, the values that you might get for payments for red, for payments for reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation if you, if you forewent deforestation on those places. And we see that at higher carbon prices, you can start to outcompete oil palm production in these regions and make it perhaps in the economic interest of landowners and resource owners in these parts of the world to not go into oil palm production but to go into forest conservation by receiving red payments. All right, well, the next question is, how are you gonna pay for all this? And so I carefully selected currencies from Canada, the US, Europe, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, because those are the developed countries that are, in, that are interested in helping meet their own greenhouse gas obligations by paying these developing countries to reduce their deforestation rates. So we can think of two fundamental ways to do this. One is to do it the way that money has often exchanged hands between the developed world and the developing world in terms of dealing with resource problems. And that's what we would call the fund approach, which is a bit like official development assistance or bilateral, multilateral aid. Um, so that's just a, one government sending money to another government and saying, do good things with this. Okay. Well, a whole other seminar or lecture course could be given on whether or not that's been the best development strategy, and I'm not going to get into that right now. But one of the things for those who criticize official development assistance is that it, it, money is given away and nothing is really counted in return. There's, there's very difficult sometimes to define, quantify how successful this money has been in achieving its aims. And so even if this approach is followed in the area of forest carbon in red, there's the expectation that it would be fo it, these payments would be performance-based. In other words, it isn't just give a billion dollars and hope for the best but you work with the country to identify what its baseline rate of emissions are going to be from deforestation, and you pay these countries for going below that rate and for sustaining 
those deforestation levels below that rate. So they have to demonstrate that they've been able to do it before they receive the money. And they have to demonstrate that they're continuing to do it in order to keep that money. And that's quite a bit different than the typical model that has been used by official development assistance. And there is an example. So the government of Norway has established a $1 billion Amazon fund that um, essentially paid, um, is paying over some period of time a $1 billion primarily to Brazil to reduce their deforestation rates up to 70% uh, within about a decade or so. It's performance-based, and it requires monitoring systems that, have not, that had not typically been used as a, as a condition for receiving money. So that's one way to do it, just continue an improved version of the status quo. Another way to accomplish this would be through the carbon market. And I'm going to describe in a few bullet points here what I mean by the carbon market and how this would work. Um, <clears throat> first, there's a general recognition that there are certain countries of the world who have made binding commitments to reduce their greenhouse gases. Um, within their borders. And these have been primarily, or I should say exclusively, developed countries. And the primary focus has been on fossil fuels in those developing countries because those have been the primary sources of greenhouse gases. So that's what the Kyoto Protocol is all about. That's what uh, Canada signed on to. That's what the U.S. originally signed on to and then signed away from. It's what the U.S. has been trying to tackle for the last five years through congressional legislation to establish a cap and trade program in the U.S. that made its way halfway through Congress and then got stalled. Obligations to meet a greenhouse gas cap. Well, with the focus on fossil fuel reductions, sometimes these reductions can take time. Um, well, unless you have a collapse of the global economy, then they can happen rather rapidly. Uh, in a rather tragicomic way, the United States greenhouse gas inventory was just released, and we found that in the year 2009, we have now returned to 1995 greenhouse gas emissions levels in the U.S. So we can thank the credit default swaps for our significant cut in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but uh, most of the people uh, in, in our country uh, don't want that to continue. Uh, they like the emissions trajectory. They don't like the economic trajectory. But anyway, by and large, it takes some time to go to a low carbon economy um, through new infrastructure, through new practices, through new investments. Uh, and so one way of looking at uh, deforestation and degradation is that something that can be done rather immediately. Uh, we know how not to cut trees down. We don't check the chainsaw out and don't cut them down. So that's something that can happen rather rapidly if indeed payments can be put up forth but I also don't want to underestimate, um, though, that there are significant disruptions that can be made to local economies and to local populations by simply stopping to exploit forests because those are serving economic needs in those communities as well. And as I described earlier, this is often a lot less expensive than fossil fuel reductions. <clears throat> so these forest opportunities generally occur in the tropics, which are places that do not have uh, an emissions cap. So they can establish a baseline, demonstrate to the developed world that they're reducing their emissions below these baseline, generate credits that can be sold on a market, denominated in tons. And those credits are called offset credits, much like the offsets that are generated here in Alberta, and sold to emitters to help them meet their compliance obligation. So that can create a significant revenue flow back into those forest countries that they can use to compensate their landowners for foregoing deforestation and to establish a different lower carbon trajectory path to economic development. <clears throat> uh, about uh, a year and a half ago, uh, colleagues of mine and I at the Nicholas Institute tried to take a look at how this might work in the context of a large U.S. cap and trade scheme, um, and, and then also how, you know, the U.S. cap-and-trade scheme would work within the context of a global carbon market for red. Um, and we found that red supply potential is enormous, something on the order of one to four billion tons of CO2 equivalent per year, which is upwards of half of the global deforestation rate 
know, having the global deforestation rate uh, on an annual basis rather quickly, uh, creating a flow of money to these uh, activities, uh, anywhere from about 10 to more than 100 billion tons uh, per year. That is so much larger than the one to two billion dollars that is spent globally on any on forestry aid of any variety. That it's you know to call it a game changer is is almost to make a mockery of that term. It's a significant change in the flow of funds, which at one level you say that's what it takes to bend the curve. Others are a little bit more skeptical that spending that amount of money is necessarily going to achieve what it is that it sets out to achieve. But these things, again, are conditioned upon paying these countries for actual demonstrated performance reductions. <clears throat> now, there are some concerns that if you create a billion tons worth of credits or four billion tons worth of credits for the global carbon market, that those could just flood out or wash out the other mitigation options. So what this might move to is a global scheme that would focus on reducing fossil fuel emissions from the energy sector to letting those sectors buy their way out of their obligations by paying forest countries to not reduce their emissions. So we also looked and see what kind of effect would this have on the rate of technological development in these other sectors, and we found that those concerns were largely overstated. We also think that there's another way of looking at this, which is to, you could look at it as saying, are you going to get less technology development by including red in a global trading scheme? Are you going to be able to get more mitigation for the same amount of money? And that's really up to the policy bankers to decide which view they would like to take. There are, however, implementation challenges with such a system. It sounds so easy on its surface, right? Just stop cutting down trees, pay the people who are cutting down the trees, pay them enough to make them happy, and everyone will go on their merry way. But as you can imagine, life is more complicated than that. And just, you know, I want to identify a few uh, challenging areas. The first of these <clears throat> is you need monitoring systems. Now, when this was first being considered in international climate negotiations back in the mid-1990s, the conclusion was that we don't have the monitoring systems in place to monitor rates of deforestation. Well, that situation has largely changed. Um, in the last 10 or 15 years. Not completely, but our satellite systems are significantly better than they were 10 or 15 years ago. And um, with new satellite systems being put in place, the notion that you can't actually observe deforestation has pretty much been put to bed. Now, it is a little bit harder to monitor carbon density of the forests that are cleared or not cleared, but there have been improvements in LIDAR technology and other types of systems that are uh, improving the ability to denominate these changes on the landscape in terms of tons of CO2, or tons of carbon equivalent. But these systems cost money and they take time. In the relative scheme of things, they don't cost that much money, though, compared to the value that we were talking about on the other pages. But then we have this issue of additionality. And so one thing I'll say is that most of the, these, um, the way this activity has been envisioned is creating projects to reduce deforestation. So I'm a landowner. I own 100,000 hectares in the Amazon. And I'm going to say to you, I'm not going to cut that forest down. You pay me. OK? So that's a project. I'm not, I, don't, I don't have any control of what happens outside of my borders, but you pay me for that. Well, that type of approach presents some problems. One of them is the issue of additionality. And I'll give you a schematic diagram of what I mean. OK? So with a project, we're going to keep this nice, lush, tropical forest in place. So the question, though, is what would have happened if we didn't have that project in place? Would it have been cleared for agriculture in this figure? And if so, then we saved all the carbon that is in this ecosystem to the left because it would have been hammered down with the agriculture clearing to the right. Or would it have just stayed the same? Did we pay somebody for doing what they would have done or what, what they would not have done anyway? And many people say, well, that, OK, the, the forests are there. Who cares if we pay something, somebody for something that they were going to do anyway? Because it's a good thing that the forest is there. The problem is with the system that I just described, 
the payments may be coming from another country who gets to emit more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as a result of paying for the credit from Brazil, for instance, for reducing their force. So if Brazil ne never actually doesn't actually reduce, this project in Brazil doesn't actually reduce their emissions, then we've allowed more emissions into the atmosphere and we've undermined the integrity of this whole trading scheme. So that's a problem. The next problem is leakage. And with leakage, we've got a situation where we've got somebody who's getting ready to cut a tree down in Indonesia. And they were going to clear it for agriculture. We've gone in there. We've paid this landowner. Don't cut the tree down. And they don't. But what happens if they just go over to the next area and cut it down over there? So we've saved a forest in one place, but we've induced the movement of activity to another place. It's outside the project boundaries. I'm the project owner. You can't really hold me harm. You know, I'm harmless for that. But the reality is that it induced a shift in market activity. The market demands a certain amount of agricultural output. The market is going to try to go seek it somewhere else. And so if you move it next door, you haven't really created much of an environmental or atmospheric benefit, uh, but you've paid the farmer uh, for credits. So that's a problem. Uh, and then the other sort of main fundamental issue is one uh, of impermanence. And that's where we've saved the forest uh, in year zero, and the, and the landowner received credits. But five years later, they went back out and cut the forest down. So all they've really done is delay the introduction of that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for five years. Now, that has some atmospheric benefit. It has about five years' worth of atmospheric benefit. But it doesn't, do any, it doesn't do anywhere near enough to offset the emission that was allowed in the first place in order to generate the demand for that credit. So that's the underlying message about these three points. It all depends on the use of these activities as part of an offset system for greenhouse gas mitigation. Some other major implementation challenges are that Property rights in many of these tropical countries are not as well established as there are in other parts of the world. Or there are local and indigenous cultures who have relied for generations, for hundreds, even thousands of years, on these local forests for their livelihoods. And they aren't necessarily the parties that are clearing off large swaths of forests, but that may be the forests that get, that get held off limits as part of these red schemes. And so, there have been interesting <clears throat> political bedfellows um, lined up against red. There have been human rights groups trying to protect the rights of local indigenous populations lined up with, um, say, environmental groups who, are very, who don't want to see these sorts of offset trading schemes which are going to let power plants in Ohio and Alberta off the hook by purchasing reduction credits from the Amazon. So there's sort of interesting bedfellows that have been formed there, uh, but it's one of the main implementation challenges is trying to deal with these um, issues and try to address them adequately. Not only a matter of dealing with them so that you can contractually obligate um, parties to do, uh, to do what it is they say they're going to do, but without buy-in from the local populations, these schemes are destined to fail in the long run. That's one of the things that we do know about evidence from conservation programs throughout the world. When there isn't buy-in from local populations, they fail. There's a whole bunch of inf institutional needs that sort of come along those lines as well. You need, uh, you know, I talked about, um, you need uh, infrastructure for observations, you need infrastructure, you need legal infrastructure to establish property rights, you need registries and exchanges to count the carbon, turn them into credits, turn them into tradable commodities. All these things need to be established at the get-go. And you also, ha you also need mechanisms to deal with the risks associated with impermanence. So if you've issued a bunch of credits and these forests end up getting cleared, in order for the accounting system to have any integrity to it, you have to replace those credits. Well, how are you going to replace those credits? Who holds the liability for replacing those credits? How is that going to play out financially? Do we expect the holders of credits to buy insurance? Do we expect the government to step in behind them and say, we're going to cover any losses, or are we going to expect the market to just say, just ignore these losses? All of these decisions have to be made. Um, <clears throat> what, what these implementation challenges mean is that this project-based approach that I alluded to 
is, is too flawed, really, to be the way forward, and national-based approaches are needed. Deforestation needs to be dealt with from a policy perspective and counted at a national level so that you can deal with issues like leakage. So if you've got leakage that moves from one forest area to another forest area and you do national accounting, you're going to cover those emissions. So all of the efforts in the last few years of dealing with this have focused on national-based approaches. <clears throat> so here we are in the international policy arena. Um, you know, we've got, I, I went to the, um, the 16th conference, that, okay, sorry. The first picture of me in a, um, it wasn't a sari, I don't know what it was, some sort of um, Indonesian uh, dress or wrap was taken by my former friend, Brent Sanjan, uh, <laughs> who I'll be um, calling after uh, the presentation today. Uh, that, was, that was at the um, 14th Conference of Parties, 13th Conference of Parties of the UN Climate Change Framework in Bali, Indonesia. That's when RED and deforestation really got put on the table as the major effort for an international agreement after the Kyoto Protocol. So it's really been a fairly recent addition to, to the debates. Uh, and it was all going to be part of this big agreement that was going to be forged in Copenhagen. And I was in Copenhagen as well, and I went to bed at 11 o'clock on Friday night thinking a deal had been struck, and I woke up to go to the airport at 4 o'clock in the morning and found out it had been undermined. So um, these are the people not who were responsible for undermining it, but who were um, at the table for you know, 27 hours straight trying to negotiate a deal. So there was a lot of promise, and they, punt <clears throat> they punted to this year's meeting in Cancun, um, which was back in December, which I um, was able to go to, and, um, and there was a modicum of success there. There is now an international agreement in place. It's a framework. It is, there is not much in specifics. And a major part of this agreement deals with RET. Um, so within the Copenhagen, I'm sorry, within, within the Cancun agreement, um, there is the established goal, it's one of the five mitigation platforms in the entire global agreement, to slow, halt, and reverse forest cover and carbon loss. But no specific targets were set. So it wasn't as if it came in and Brazil said, we'll do this, and Indonesia said, we'll do that, and Canada said, we'll do this, and the US said, we'll do that. No, it's essentially established a set of principles. The scope of the effort has moved from the early days of focusing just on deforestation to expansion to degradation, to expansion to conserving forest carbon stocks, to sustainable forest management, to enhanced forest carbon stocks. So this is this movement to this, when you hear the term red plus, the best way to think of it is to manage the entire forest estate in these countries as part of an agreement that originally started to be just about deforestation. Um, it requires every one of these forest countries to establish a national plan uh, to reduce deforestation. So it, it, despite what I said earlier about how we can just stop deforestation immediately, it's actually harder than that. Um, it, you know, many of these countries have national plans for agriculture, for forests, for roads, for energy, and these need to be modified to account for a change in the way the land is going to be managed to reduce the amount of forest clearing. Um, the countries have to establish uh, what's called a national forest um, reference level or a baseline. So what are the deforestation emissions uh, from each country? They need to be uh, developed with valid techniques and um, uh, submitted to the international community for agreement. Um, national forest monitoring systems need to be put in place and a system for providing information on various different safeguards, which I'll describe in a minute. <clears throat> this will happen in three phases. The first phase is the development of strategies phase. The second phase is taking these strategies and beginning to implement them. And the third stage is when you start to deliver the actual reductions for compensation. So the first stage has already started. Um, there's already been roughly $5 billion committed by the global community to finance the planning and capacity building stages of RED. Um, pilot projects are beginning in some of these countries. And the idea is that within, say, five years or so, we'll start to see demonstrated emission reductions that will be compensated by the rest of the world. Uh, there are a variety of safeguards that, uh, have, that will be required to be put in place um, that uh, deal with issues like governance and transparency. Uh, some of these countries have had um, 
shall I say, issues in the past with receiving money from outside parties and it not making its way to the intended parties within the country. So systems be, need to be put in place to be able to tr track, track the money. Um, you have, have to be strong protections for social, um, for, uh, for social protections, for, uh, uh, for local populations and for indigenous rights, to protect biodiversity, to guard against the reversals or the permanence issue uh, that I described earlier, and to deal with the leakage issue. And again, most of that has been pivoted around the notion that these pro pro uh, policies will operate at a national scale. What's been left undecided <clears throat> is whether or not the market-based approach that I described earlier can be the source of phase three funds. There's a great debate in the international community about whether or not they want to see these forest reductions serving as a substitute for emissions reductions in other sectors in the developed world, or whether they should be entirely supplemental to that. On the flip side of that, there's a the notion that unless you allow the developed countries to use this to meet their compliance obligations, you won't get the 10 to 50 to 100 billion dollars that has been described as available for these types of activities. So it could be a matter of choosing between a very, um, a, a very, a program with very high bar to get over, but one that ends up being very small in terms of influence in the landscape, and one with a lower bar to get over, but would provide more money. Um, and there's other implementation issues, like how do you define a forest, which hasn't been um, yet uh, determined. So um, as you can imagine, that ends up mattering when you start to implement these policies. <clears throat> and California, now uh, as of December when they, or I'm sorry, November, when the voters of California finally approved to, to keep their cap and trade bill uh, in place, one that was signed into law by Governor Schwarzenegger back in 2006, uh, it has, as part of its compliance package, the use of red credits. Uh, and this is through bilateral agreements at the state and provincial level with states and provinces in Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, and Nigeria. And so when I talk about national level programs, these are state level programs, <clears throat> but the accounting must occur at the state level. So this is a really novel agreement uh, between California. A lot of people are very excited about the fact that it's the first compliance market for red in the world, but a lot of people are also, as they start to count the carbon, they realize this is only a $70 million uh, 70 million ton market uh, for over a nine year period, which is rather small. Um, probably, um, that's probably smaller, uh, no, it's clearly smaller than the deforestation emissions from a decent sized um, state uh, in an annual uh, in, in, uh, in Brazil. So it's a, it's a great start from a lot of people's perspective, but it won't be large enough to have a significant impact on global deforestation patterns. So the next five years are going to determine whether this has been a transformational change in the way forests are managed, the way forests are protected, or whether it's going to be yet another footnote on the long road, which has been only moderately successful in saving the world's forests. So there's two things I want to leave you with, which is sort of <clears throat> good news, bad news. First one is, um, I don't know how well you can see that, but there's a, a jagged line there that shows the deforestation rate in the Brazilian Amazon uh, over the last 20 years or so. And many of you may know this, but the deforestation rate in the Amazon has plummeted in the last five years. Which leads to the question is, are these programs already working? Are programs like the Amazon Fund from Norway having their impact? Or is Brazil getting its own house in order, realizing it's now of a big player, it's one of the big emerging economies, and it needs to demonstrate to the rest of the world that it could manage its own environment, manage its own forests. So it's kind of part of the growing up here. <coughs> or does it simply mean that the world economy's collapse of the last few years has dampened the demand for soybean and cattle in such ways that it hasn't been economic to clear these forests? The jury is still out on that, although there's a very strong sense by people who examine this issue closely 
that much of it does have to do with policy. So that's a good thing because this is the largest emitting country, the largest deforesting country, and the country with the largest potential for continued deforestation in the world. So I'd say that is a cautiously optimistic thing that we're observing. Not as optimistic is uh, a study that was published in Science this month that I was asked to um, <clears throat> comment on National Public Radio uh, over the weekend about, about what this would mean for a carbon market trading scheme. And it's a study that has determined that the drought in the Amazon in 2005 led to the release of more carbon dioxide through mortality and fires than the entire annual emissions of the United States. And then it's very likely that the drought that existed in the Amazon in 2010 was equally as large. <clears throat> so you take all these efforts to reduce the rates of deforestation in a country, you still have a lot of forest left over. Uh, and what are you left with? You're left with a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That starts to point to these sort of scary scenarios that some people paint about the feedback effects between a changing climate and the, the systems that we have on our surface to regulate the flow of carbon dioxide between ecosystems in the atmosphere. We've heard a lot about those concerns in the boreal zone and peat, um, peat releases through thawing, and we've heard uh, a lot of concern about that in the Amazon. Um, I would still contend uh, that it is probably not a wise mitigation strategy to cut down the Amazon to avoid these losses uh, in the future. Uh, because A, there's still a lot of scientific uncertainty about the magnitude of these losses, <clears throat> and secondly, um, saving forests have a lot of other ecosystem values, uh, spiritual values, and there are many, many reasons to continue to move in that direction. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank you for the invitation, and I'd like to open the floor for any questions that you might have.